Well, good morning, church. We are so glad to see you here for worship today. It's going to be an awesome day of worship. We've got a powerful message this morning. We're going to get to celebrate a bunch of baptisms at the end of the service. We're going to sing together and pray together. It's going to be an amazing morning. But to start it off with a great blessing for us, our Wednesday night cherub choir is going to lead us in a few songs. These are the guys that if you come on Wednesday nights to our service or to a small group and you have little kids, they are learning about worship. And so we're very grateful for our volunteers who help to steward that and, and to lead this. So would you give it up this morning for our Wednesday night cherub choir? Oh my goodness, that was just wonderful. So now y'all gonna have to match that when y'all sing, okay? Y'all ready for that, that deep and wide? Well, what a wonderful morning, starting with our children singing, and also we're gonna have uh, a baptism this morning. We're gonna have some baptisms later on in our service as well. So just wanna remind you that through the sacrament of baptism, God proclaims his love, and he extends his grace to us even before we can understand it. When a child is baptized, the parents declare their faith in Jesus Christ, their love for the church, and they accept responsibility for disciplining their child in the Christian faith with both God's help and your help 
as their brothers and sisters in Christ. So today we are celebrating this sacred moment with McKinley and Sarah Elizabeth Lee and their son Greeley. Hey, Greeley Lee. I have three questions for you, the parents, um, and then I'm going to have one for you as the faith family as well. So do you, McKinley and Sarah Elizabeth, in presenting Greeley for holy baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And do you accept as your responsibility and privilege to set an example for Greeley, to bring him up in a Christian faith, to disciple him in the Holy Scriptures? And will you incorporate Greeley within the ministry and guidance of the church until the time when he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord? Okay. And at church family, it's also our responsibility to be an example and to disciple Greeley, surround him with love and support. So I want to ask you, as brothers and sisters in Christ, do you so, uh, will you do so? And if you will, respond by saying, we will. Okay, wonderful. Greeley, you going to come? Can you say hello? Hey, sweetie. How are you, Greeley? We're right here. Yeah. Greeley Lee, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, blessings. Come see your church family. Yeah. Hello to Greeley. Oh, wonderful. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for Greeley. We thank you for life. We thank you for this family. We pray your special blessings upon them. Lord, be with Greeley as he grows. Help him to come to know you as his Lord and Savior. And guide these parents, give them your encouragement and your wisdom. For this we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Oh, you did wonderful. Well, sir, just what you see in your worship, why don't we stand to our feet? Let's turn and meet somebody new around us and we'll get going. sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we call death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came And he died And he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God This is who he is He loves us This is our God This is what he does He saves us That fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper And now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story
God who is merciful, the God who is only good, is a God of covenant. He keeps his word, he keeps his promises. We declare that together this morning in faith. Come on, let's sing together. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say and though the storms may come and the winds may blow i'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass declare church great is your faith To the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Come on, is anybody grateful for that this morning? You're faithful through the ages. Come on, we sing this together, God of age to age. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word. I put, my faith. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and the foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and the
Amen. Church, you all can be seated. Well, good morning, church. We are so excited that you're here with us this morning to join together as a faith family and give God the praise that Preparing for this morning, I was just struck once again by the fact that Jesus didn't just go and call us to repentance, that he didn't just go and he didn't just talk about the spiritual things, but that he had compassion, that he met people where they were, that he saw their needs, that he went to a wedding and saw they were out of the wine and he turned it, wine into water, that he saw the crowds that were hungry and had nowhere to go for food and he fed them, that he saw the hurting, that he saw the broken and the blind and he healed them. We serve such a mighty God and we are his hands and feet now, church, and we get to do that for others. Yes, we call the world to repentance. Yes, we preach the gospel but we also meet people where they are. We help the hungry, we help the hurting. And I am so proud to be at a church who does that so beautifully here in this community, in the River Region, and around the world. And the beautiful part is you get to be a part of that because we come and we give back just a little bit of what the Lord has given us. And we trust that he takes that and he multiplies it and he helps the hurting. We reach into the hurting places here in our community and around the world through your faithfulness. Just last weekend, we had a group of people from our young adult ministry go and do yard work for widows who didn't have people who could do that for them. They weren't physically able. Uh, Yesterday, we had over 98, I think, men come and join and learn about the Lord and have community with other believers. In a few weeks, we're gonna have our mental health summit. All of this is possible because of your generosity. So if you'd like to give today, I'm gonna go ahead and ask our ushers to come. They're gonna take their place here at the front. You can give while they pass the plate. Come on. You can also give by giving in the boxes located at the back of the worship center, or as always, you can give in our secure app or website by texting the number that you see on the screen. Will you pray with me over our offering this morning? Gracious God, you are so good. And we are so grateful Lord, that you love us and that you see us where we are. And Lord, we want to be part of your kingdom's work here in this world, Lord. And so we give back today a portion of what you've given us. And Lord, we trust that you are able and you are faithful to use that through the ministries of this church, Lord, to bring light to the darkness, hope for the hurting. Lord, we love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as they go and pass the plates, there's a few things I wanna bring to your attention. First, we wanna celebrate a birth. A new baby um, has joined our faith family, a daughter to Christopher and Madison Holmes. And we rejoice with them over her birth, sweet Lainey Ray, um, and her new life. We do wanna let you know about a few things that are coming up in the life of our church. Um, First is our women's ministry is hosting a widow's picnic. picnic. It's gonna be on Wednesday, May 8th. It's free. Um, We want you to come. We just need to know a number. So if you can register, the deadline is by May 2nd. Let us know you're coming. You can do that on the website or in the Fraser app. We also are so honored and humbled to host the annual conference of the Southeast region of the Free Methodist Church. We're gonna do that in June, June 5th through 8th. And um, we're getting ready for them. And we're asking our church family to come and help us. So we're calling it Love My Church Day. It's gonna be on Saturday, May 18th, right here at the church. We're gonna have coffee and donuts. So come on out, get fueled up on some sugar. We're gonna prepare our worship spaces as well as our classroom, our meeting spaces for annual conference. And we also want you to know about um, Gaither Vocal Band. We have an amazing concert coming up. Um, this Friday, it's gonna be in Wesley Hall. Doors open at six, the show starts at seven. You can find out about ticket information on our website or our app, but it's gonna be a great evening. We hope you've made plans to attend. And then finally, if you haven't yet, we hope that you will go and visit our partner, Life South. They're out in the atrium today. You can give the gift of life today. They're gonna be there until one o'clock um, in the atrium, so you can go and donate blood there. Well, since January, We have had a group of people who have been preparing to be the hands and feet, just like we talked about, of Jesus to the hurting um, through our cancer care ministry. So I'm gonna invite this team up if they'll come and they can take their places down at the front. We just wanna encourage them, we wanna pray for them, we wanna commission them as they go out. The cancer care ministry has been meeting for eight sessions and equipping these um, individuals to walk alongside those who are living with a cancer diagnosis, um, offering them prayers and support and just having a listening ear. So we're gonna pray for them. And as I was thinking about this group, I was reading through Galatians and it says, bear one another's burdens and so 
fulfill the law of Christ. And then it goes on to say, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. So I'm gonna encourage you, don't grow weary. You will reap a harvest. Um, and bearing one, another bur- one another's burdens is just such a privilege as a Christian. Will you reach a hand out to them and we'll pray for them before we continue. Gracious God, Lord, I pray your equipping hand over this group. Lord, I pray your spirit would be poured out upon them. Father, I pray that you would anoint them, give them wisdom, give them understanding. God, give them everything they need, the strength they need to go and to speak life and hope and healing over those who are going through these difficult times, Lord. Your word promises that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you go with us. And so, Lord, I trust in you, and I pray that they would trust in you, that you go before them, beside them, within them, and behind them. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's give them a hand. If you will, we're going to read scripture. Will you stand as you're able for the reading of God's word? We're in Joshua, it's chapter two, and I'll be reading verses one through 14 from the ESV. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to close at dark, the men went out. I do not know where they went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax as she laid them in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on their way to Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lie down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you so much for being here. It's an exciting day. We have some uh, more baptisms to celebrate in just a moment. I'm also thankful for uh, those who are watching online and on television. For those of you in the room, would you please give our online TV audience a big hand. Before we jump into Joshua chapter two, uh, I want us uh, to celebrate just for a moment. So I want to ask Craig McKissick to come up here. Uh, Craig has worked in our sports ministry over in the John Ed Matheson Activity Center for 20 years, and he is retiring. Yeah. Uh, It's like mixed reviews on that, you know? Hey, he made it to retirement, guys. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. (laughs) Also... Also, I want to invite Brittany Ken up as well, Uh, but uh, Craig, I'm so thankful for this man. He, uh, just his heart, the many, many lives that he's poured into over 20 years has been absolutely incredible, not just touching the lives uh, of boys and girls, but also adults and parents uh, and grandparents and guardians, and so I'm so thankful for him. So Craig, would you like to share a word with us? Yeah. Tell you, it's really been an an honor to serve on the Fraser staff for 20 years. I've really 
enjoyed the privilege of partnering ministry with so many wonderful people. I think about the staffs I've had uh, since I started in 2004, all the way to the present, just outstanding people to work with, and also the volunteers. A ministry like this doesn't happen without great volunteers, and I've had so many over the years. I just would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to all you invested. Uh, hopefully there's eternal impact that'll take place because of that. Thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, Brittany Kent is up here because uh, she's going to be taking Craig's position. Uh, we've hired her away from Alabama State University, so thankful for that. Uh, but uh, her undergrad is actually in athletic training, but she also has a Master's of Divinity from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And so we just really believe that the Lord has positioned Brittany for such a time as this uh, to go into this role. So, so thankful for you. Would you like to share something? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank y'all for the opportunity to serve. I'm excited to see what God is doing here. Obviously, a background in athletic training and in ministry is really interesting. To, so to combine both of my passions, I'm really excited. Um, and to see, being from Montgomery, just to see the opportunities that God has in store for sports and just for the ministry here at Fraser. So yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Good deal. Well. Before we let them go, let's pray for them. Father, I think in your providence, you had us last week talk about transitions. And so, Lord, I just thank you that uh, in your wisdom and power, you have made this one possible. Lord, I thank you for Craig and all the many years in which he has served and glorified you in so many beautiful and amazing ways. Pray your blessings on him as he begins this new chapter in his life. And Lord, I thank you for Brittany and all that you've done in her life to bring her to this point. And Lord, we just pray as she begins this new chapter, would you pour out your spirit on her just as you did, Craig? Lord, we thank you and we look forward to many more amazing years of boys and girls and parents and families being impacted while we do our best through sports ministry to glorify and honor you. Lord, we pray your blessings in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's, I know we just prayed, but I want to pray the Lord will help us see what he has for us this morning in his word. God, thank you for this word from Joshua. And Lord, I pray as we look at uh, this familiar story in many ways in Rahab, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, minds to receive what it is you have for us this morning. So speak, Lord, your servants are listening. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Reveal Research Project a few years ago went on a search for Joshua's, Joshua's. They surveyed uh, over a thousand churches and all their members. And they were looking for people who wanted to live their life in such a way in which they really and truly loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then they would love their neighbor as themselves. And these were people who wanted to live like Joshua, to be strong and courageous in their faith. And then they found a number as they surveyed more than a thousand different churches. Thousands upon thousands of church members, just like you and me, they found a number, they found a percentage of the people who really wanted to love God with all their heart and love others with all their heart. The percentage was 11%. 11%. 11% of the people they surveyed said that they passionately wanted to and lived out, wanted to love God with all their heart and then love their neighbor. 11%. Max Licato writing about this survey said, that means that nearly nine out of 10 believers languish in the wilderness. Saved? Yes. Empowered? No. They waste away in the worst of ways, in the land of in-between. Out of Egypt, but not yet in Canaan. 11%. If a high school graduated only 11% of its students, if a hospital healed only 11% of its patients, if a baseball team only won 11% of its games, if a home builder only completed 11% of his projects, wouldn't changes be made? The church has a serious deficiency, end quote. Joshua 
And the book that bears his name is a picture of God bringing the people out of bondage so that he can bring them into a place of blessing. And this is the same for me and you. That's why this book speaks to us. God has brought us out of darkness so that we can live in the light. He has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness so that we can live in the kingdom of his son. And yet many Christians, even some in this room, find themselves not living in the fullness of of what God has for them. You may be saved, but the question is, are you living fulfilled? Are you truly living in such a way where you say, yes, I am a part of that 11% who wanna love God with all of my heart, and then I'm gonna live that out by loving others every and any way I can. Joshua has something to say about all of this because the book of Joshua points forward to our Christian reality, what is accomplished on the cross and in the empty tomb, and now the life of victory we get to live. Alan Redpath wisely wrote, the Christian does not work up toward victory, he works down from victory. We do not struggle toward it, but we stand in it because of the cross in the empty tomb. And that's why we're studying the book of Joshua now for the next 16 weeks. Joshua is the first book in the Bible named after its main character. The book of Joshua is what scholars call a bridge book. It is a bridge between the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then you have Joshua, and then you have the next eight books of the Bible. And that is Judges and Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. In the previous five books, the first five books of the Bible, we see God forming his people. We see him making promises to them, but they are very much outside the promised land. In Joshua, they are going into the promised land. And in the next eight books, you have Israel living in the promised land ultimately before they go into captivity. And so Joshua is this bridge between these years of wandering and then living in the land. And what Joshua shows us, the big idea, is that God is keeping his covenant promise that he has made to Abraham, and he made it back in Genesis 12, 7, when he says, your offspring will inherit this land. And that land that Abraham was standing on was Canaan itself. Now, what we see is that the land of Canaan was a land of plenty, as the Bible calls it. In Exodus 3, 8, it's described as a land flowing with milk and honey. And then in Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, we see the vastness of it. We looked at this last week, where it says that from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, it all will be yours, says the Lord. And today we come to Joshua chapter two. And again, the story is familiar to us, the story of Rahab. And yet, in many ways, this story is perplexing if you think about it. And for people who have read this, both Jews and Christians, for generations, we read this and it raises some questions. One person brought out the fact that there's many questions raised here. For example, why does Joshua send in spies? Who are the spies? If they are spies, why are they so quickly identified? They don't seem to be very good at it. What leads to their encounter with Rahab? How did that happen? How should Rahab's situation and occupation be evaluated? Why should Rahab, why would she offer the spies shelter and protection? Why would she do that in the first place? Or how should Christian readers regard the description that she perpetuates on the spies' behalf? Because she lies repeatedly. And the questions go on and on. But I think we step back for a moment. We step back and we look at Rahab's story for just a moment. We're going to see something. We're going to see that regardless of her past life or her current occupation here, we will see that we actually find ourselves in the same situation. We, like Rahab, find ourselves having to make a choice. So Joshua chapter two, verse one. And Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly to Shittim as spies, saying, go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, this escalated quickly, behold, the men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, 
bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. Now notice the characters that are involved here. Representing Israel, you have two men identified as spies. No names are given. And their job is to go in and view the land, especially Jericho. So representing Israel here are two spies who are going on this reconnaissance mission, if you will, and they are doing this in secret. Representing Jericho is the king of Jericho. He's identified in verse 2 simply by his title. Again, no name is given. The king would have been the elite of the elites in that city. He would be the person in the highest position of power. And the king does not have to do anything in secret. In fact, all of his movements are known. And if he tried to do something in secret, he wouldn't be able to because someone is always watching him because they are always protecting him. And notice that the king knows Rahab. So here you have Israel, God's people, Represented by two spies who are going around in secret. But they are detected and they're found out and they're told on to the king. And then you have the king of Jericho who lives his life against God very publicly, very publicly. He's searching for these spies because he's heard that they are there and he wants to find him, find them. And here we see Rahab has a question. The question that she has to answer and it's a question that you and I have to answer. The question is not explicit in the text, but the implication is there. And the question that Rahab had to answer, the question that you and I had to have to answer is who do I side with? Who do I side with? Two spies representing Israel who claim to have Yahweh as their God. Or my king, in Rahab's case, representing her pagan city and system of worship and all those gods. Who does she side with? How does she make the decision? Does she side with the king of Jericho? The pagan king who wants nothing to do with God, nothing to do with God's ways. Or or does she side with two unknown people who got caught, at least they know they're in the city, who represent Israel who are coming to take her land? See the dilemma? No one saw it. Okay. (laughs) So why in the world, or what in the world is she going to do? Notice verse 4. But the woman... Rahab had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, because the king is called out, send them out, send them out. So she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. That's lie number one. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. That's lie number two. I do not know where the men went. That's lie number three. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. That's lie number four. It's impossible, because they're not there. She, verse six, brought them up on the roof, hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. Verse seven, so the men pursued after them, on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Notice Rahab makes a choice, and notice her choice. In these moments, she chooses to side with the two spies and therefore the people of Israel. And to do this, she has to go against her king. He's not just a king, he's her king. She has to go against her king who has absolute control, or at least sovereignty, over her life. And over everybody else who lives in Jericho. And she's probably have spent her life there. And what a choice. What a choice. 
It seems like in the span of just a few moments or maybe a few hours, Rahab's allegiance completely shifts from her king, her city, her territory, her safety to her helping to unknown men and all the people that they represent who are on their way to her to take her land. And the question is, why did she do it? Why did she do it? She had a choice to make. Why did she make this one? Point number one is this. Is that only God's stories can melt our heart. Only God's stories can melt our heart. Notice what happens in verse 8. Before the men lay down, Rahab comes up and meets with them on the roof. And she says, I know, I know something. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard, we've heard a story, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And we've heard something. We heard about the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, whom you devout, uh, devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard, as soon as we heard it, we're hearing these God stories, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Why? For the Lord your God, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. What Rahab came to believe was not so much about fearing dried up waters of the Red Sea, was not so much at being astonished that these people had been set free from captivity in Egypt. It was not necessarily to stand in awe of these two kings of the Amorites who had been destroyed, but all of these stories pushed her to this place where she came to the conclusion that her heart was melting, melting. She was not so captivated by the miracles but she was captivated by the miracle worker. And she said, here's why. For the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and on earth beneath. And all the stories that Rahab had been hearing about God and what he was doing through his people brought her to that conclusion. That the God of the people of Israel, the God that they talk about, he really is the God of heavens above and earth below. Which means that there is nothing, nothing in the heavens above or the earth below that he cannot do. And the result was a melted heart. You know, there are a lot of good stories in the world. A lot of them. And a lot of those stories inspire us. A lot of those stories encourage us. A lot of those stories stir us emotionally. But there's only one whose stories can melt our heart. Only one. And Rahab is converted. Yes, converted. Just go read Hebrews 11. Rahab is converted here. Not just because she stood in fear of these things that were happening out there. Rahab was converted because her heart melted as she heard about the awesomeness of God. And when God shines brightly through his stories and his movements that are happening around us, it will either melt our hearts or it will harden our hearts. As the Puritans used to say, that God is either going to, it's going to melt your heart like ice or it's going to harden your heart like clay. When God shines, you're going to have one or two reactions. And Rahab's heart melted. Because all of a sudden, we see this shift in language in her. We know her heart is melted. We know it is true conversion because there's a shift in her language. All of a sudden, she starts using a particular phrase over the next few verses, and this is evidence. And if you ever wonder, how do I know I'm really saved? Listen to this part. Verse 12, now then, she says to the men, the two spies, swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. 
And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. You see the repeated phrase, deal kindly or dealt kindly, deal kindly, deal kindly. This phrase can be translated, apply goodness, literally. Apply, to apply goodness to something. You see, the overflow of a melted heart is the ability to apply goodness, to apply kindness to others. That's exactly what she's doing. And not just any others. Notice who she's applying goodness to. This is crazy if you think about it. We all know that scripture testifies to the fact that, that it's very easy to be kind to those who are kind to you. The Bible hears that and just kind of says, whoop de doo That's Greek. <laughs> Jesus said in Luke 6, 33 through 35, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. He says, that's not my way. And if you do good to those who do good to you, well, what benefit is that to you? Or even sinners do the same. He said, you're no different. You're as lost as the day is long. You just do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Rahab, in a sense, lives this out in a very interesting way. Because Rahab's heart melted and she came to this place where she could say out loud that Israel's God is the God of the heavens above and the earth below. She was able to love her enemies. And who were her enemies in this situation? The two spies. The ones coming, representing Israel, coming to take her land that she lives on. In a natural world, though, they would be enemies. And then something shifts. Her heart melts. And all of a sudden, now spiritually, they are brothers and sisters in Christ, connected in covenant under, under God. Because her heart melted, she was able to apply goodness. She was able to lend the two spies her roof as a place to hide. Because her heart melted, her reward was great. And she identified as a child of the Most High again. Read Hebrews 11. Because her heart melted, she experienced the kindness, the goodness of God. Because he's kind to the ungrateful and the evil, which is exactly what she was before her heart melted. See, only God can melt a heart like that. Because only God can melt a heart. A lot of great stories in the world. Read them, listen to them, watch them all. Wonderful. But only one kind of story, God's stories, can melt our heart. Point number two, and I only have two. You're welcome. <laughs> As you know the goodness of God has changed your heart when you can give God's goodness to others. Rahab's radical shift in loyalty, in applying goodness toward the most unlikely characters in this narrative. Remember, two spies representing Israel coming to take her land. Going to completely change everything she knows about reality and life. And yet she shows them this radical goodness. And in so doing, she shows that her understanding had changed radically. Because Rahab had to ask and wrestle with, at least on some level, the question, who is really good in this situation? Because remember, her fundamental question is, who do I side with? And a part of who do I side with is, who do I see as good in this situation? And this is the same for any situation. We're going to pick whichever one we think is good, better, right? 
Is the king of the Amorites with their pagan worship, total disregard for human life, even sacrificing their own children literally? That was not like figurative. It's not a metaphor. They were literally sacrificing their children to Moloch. Are they good? Or how about the kings of Jericho? The king of Jericho, is he good? His pursuit of power, his vain view of himself as the mighty one in the land, the one who gets to make all the decisions. Don't you love people like that? Or is God good? Egypt, the God who overthrows the pagan kings of the Amorites, the God who seems to side with the weak because he's chosen Israel, the weakest on the planet, to be his people. So you see Rahab's loyalty shift radically here, radically away from those who are in power, like the king of Jericho, to God. And in that moment, she's saying, I believe that God is good. I believe that God's goodness is on display and being seen as he's overthrowing the sin and destructiveness of all these pagan kings and their cultures in that sense. She believes that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is good. And this is a picture of conversion. It is a picture of true conversion. And that's why we're in the same place as Rahab. That's why we're asking the same kind of question that Rahab was asking so long ago. It's because of the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that changed Rahab's heart. She's seeing it on display. And she becomes captivated by this good God who would overthrow ungodliness. And it's that goodness of God that changed her heart. Because it's the goodness of God that melts our heart. There's a lot of Christians today. I mean, we, we should just hand out PhDs in condemnation. I mean, they're just brilliant. And it's sickening to watch. Because condemnation, my friends, does not melt a heart. Condemnation does not melt a heart. It may speak to a reality. You're either condemned or you're not. But it does not melt a heart. What melts a heart is the goodness of God. That's why Romans 2, 4 says, do, not, do, you, uh, do you despise the riches of his goodness? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. And once the goodness of God has been received through repentance, it can then be given by grace to others. It is in seeing the goodness of God that our depravity is exposed. Because when you see how good God is, you realize just how not good you are. And that exposure then will melt away all those things that puff us up, or at least it should. But if your heart melts under the goodness of God, that's when you're able to apply that goodness, give that goodness to others. In other words, when you have experienced the goodness of God, it melts away your selfishness and your self-righteousness that are so rampant because those things no longer have control of your heart. If you ever meet a person who is prideful and arrogant and self-righteous and a know-it-all and a person who hates certain people or hates certain groups of people and they claim to be Christian, they're probably not. Probably not. Because when you are converted, like Rahab, true conversion melts, or should I say, burns all those things away. So my question to you that I leave you with is, do you have a melted heart? I know that our culture all around us tells us to be strong in the sense of some kind of elitism and find that strength within ourselves. But has your heart been melted by the goodness of God. In other words, have you experienced true conversion or have you been playing sing-along at church and read-along in the Bible? So when you see the goodness of God and you're captivated by that, when it's the goodness that melts your heart, that's, that's 
when you're truly converted, and you will give it to others. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, semicolon, test yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Church, he's writing to a church. Test yourselves. And that's what I put before you this morning. We as the church, we are to do that. We claim to be Christian, we are to do that. Examine ourselves to see if we really are in the faith. We are to test ourselves. We want to test God, we want to test everything else around us. He says, test yourself to see if you really have this faith that has melted your heart because of the goodness of God, and then do you give that goodness Apply it to others because we'll never live a victorious life until God is victorious over your heart. Amen? I want to pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you for real, true, authentic, radical conversion where your goodness shines on us and you melt our hearts in such a way you burn away all those things that are not of you. All of a sudden we see you as the Lord, as the Lord God, who truly is the God of the heavens above and the earth below. And we see that because your goodness has been on display around us as you overthrow Pharaoh, the Pharaohs of this world, as you overthrow the kings of the Amorites of this world, as you overthrow the Pharaohs of our heart and the kings of the Amorites of our heart. And so Lord, I pray that for those of us who sit in this room right now, we call ourselves Christian, we claim the name of Christ. I pray that we would actually examine ourselves to see if we are actually in the faith. Or Lord, are we living out of some kind of self-righteousness? God, we need a melted heart. We need a heart melted by your goodness, that we may experience your grace, that we may repent, and that we may give that goodness to others. Lord, would you grant that to us? And Lord, would you be with those who are being baptized now? I pray for each one that their hearts would continue to be melted in the days ahead under the goodness of your hand on their life. I pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name. And everybody said, amen. Here in just a moment, we're gonna go into baptisms. And I want to encourage you to, uh, uh, as we worship, as we sing, as we pray, and as they go under the water and come out, let's celebrate the way heaven's celebrating today. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you please stand to your feet?
God. Doesn't it just do your heart good to see these people giving their life to Christ and to know that he is working already and will continue to work in their lives. We're so grateful for what he's doing in the life of this church. And I do wanna encourage you as you go home and you let the Lord work in your hearts based on what the Lord shared with us through Pastor Chris, we all have a choice to make. We all get to decide if our hearts will milk like ice or if they're hardened like clay. And I wanna encourage you, brothers and sisters, it's not a one-time decision. It's not, a, it's not a faith question. It's not a heaven or hell question. It's and of sin, your pride, your self-righteousness. It's a daily surrendering and a melting to the Lord. If you need prayer today, we'd be so humbled to pray with you. There'll be volunteers at the stained glass windows. You can text or call a number that you'll see on the screen. The soldier on, armor on. We are the light of the world. Will you receive this benediction before we go? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, amen.